in the story that precedes this lesson that Cindy read to us, uh, the rich man uh, had a manager. And the manager was no Robin Hood. The manager was totally out for himself. This manager was robbing his rich master, stealing his master's property, but he was not giving to the poor. He was stealing it for his own personal gain. And he was about to be found out. So what the dishonest manager did was, he went to those who owed his master money, and he took it upon himself to cancel much of their debt. Do you owe my master a hundred? Pay fifty. I'll change the books. Do you owe my master sixty? Pay forty. I'll cook the books. His reasoning was this. His master was going to find a fire him anyway, so those who owed his master money would be so grateful that the cheating master had cut their debts that they would take the crooked manager into their homes and take care of him. He'd have a place to go when he lost his job. Pretty smart thinking, huh? Here's where the story gets really strange. Jesus says in the story, when the master found out what the manager was doing, he, condemned, he commended the manager not for being honest, but for being so shrewd. In other words, yes, you're going to get fired, but kudos to you for providing a future for yourself. That doesn't sound like Jesus, does it? And then Jesus says this, this evil manager understood the temptation and the power of money better than those of you who call yourselves my followers, those of you who call yourselves children of the light. Jesus said, make friends with the crooked uses of money so that you will be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven, but don't serve money. Kind of sounds like our Bible study this morning, doesn't it? Jesus said you cannot serve God and serve money. Now why would Jesus say this? Couldn't Jesus' followers count? Were they just bad with money? <clears throat> well, in a sense, yes. Many were professing the love of God as experienced through Christ Jesus, but perhaps in terms of their ability to give to each other, to provide for each other, to make places of warmth and safety for the least of these, to sacrifice for the greater good, they were, like everybody else, not stepping out on faith, not helping a sister or a brother who needed help. They were saying, I love you, Lord, I follow you, Lord, but they were just like the Pharisees, hoarding their resources. On the Little White Chapel Facebook page, there's a picture blog where a photographer takes homeless people, and even as he describes their descent into homelessness, he dresses them in the costumes of the dreams to which they originally aspired. A homeless person who aspired to become an airman. A, a homeless person who aspired to become a police officer. A homeless person who at one time aspired to become a marine biologist. A homeless young lady who at one time wanted to be a beauty queen, but she was locked in the trunk of a car and taken around by people and compromised and compromised and compromised until she lost her sense of who she was. If only someone had, rather than hoarding their resources, invested enough time and money into those people to make a difference. Jesus says no one can serve God and money. I was in another city this week where another young black teenager was killed by police. It made national news, you probably heard about it. Allegedly, the young man was robbing a store and he was caught in the act. He pulled a make believe gun on the police and the police killed him. So now his church going parents want a 
personal investment. His parents are church-going people. When are children of the light going to teach their children that robbery is wrong and when you pull a weapon on the authorities of the law, you will pay the price with your life. It has nothing to do with your perception of the police as trustworthy or not. If you are shrewd, you know the police are authorities of the law, sworn to uphold it. Shrewd parents of this age must teach their children whom to trust and then keep their children busy to the point of exhaustion inside of trustworthy communities. Do black lives matter? Yes! Yes! And you and I know there was a time when black lives have not mattered as much. All lives matter. But it is a waste of time and education and money to think that your 14-year-old child needs to have free, unsupervised time at night out in the streets. No child needs that. Children of the light need to learn this. This place, with all of its imperfections, this is the place for children of the light to bring their children. Children of the light need to keep their children in scout troops. People of the light need to come to faith communities like Little White Chapel every week and work with Little White Chapel to form programs for children, children that circumvent the lure of the streets. We are not perfect here, but we are a place that believes in the worth of all people. Children are safe here. T children just don't know how to act. They're not born knowing how to act. No one can just take what they want because they think they can get away with it. Children have to come to a place where they learn spiritual principles, where they learn right from wrong. One of the things that we learn is Jesus said, no one can serve God and money. Grace means the unmerited favor of God. We first understand the term when in the sixth chapter of Genesis in the wicked city of Sodom, God favors Noah. Jesus explains the unmerited favor of God as he tells the story of the father welcoming home the prodigal son or the story of the good Samaritan helping the wounded man on the side of the road. That is God's grace, unmerited favor. What God, through the teachings and the life of His Son, calls us to do is to use our money, and yes, the offering boxes are at the front of the sanctuary. We are called to use our money and indeed our lives to reflect God's grace to others. That is why we gather in this place. We are not a closed in club. We are to love God and with all that we have, share that love with others. We don't always agree with what that grace looks like, but we agree that we are called to do something more than sit in our increasingly beautiful, comfortable church and not reach out to living, breathing, searching seekers in the 21st century. Last week, so many of you commented on how moved you were by the service of remembrance for the victims of 9-11 and their families. Now, I agree with you, the service largely led by the Little White Chapel of elders, the lay leaders and the music department was very, very moving. Yet we cannot wait until tragedy strikes again to become a people to unite before God, before God. In the 12th chapter of Mark, Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead, 
But she, the God is the God of the living. Of the living. You and I have to gather together in this place and struggle with each other and disagree with each other, but continually come up with a plan to make children and adults and homeless people and all kinds of people safe in the love of God. On that back table out the back, there, there's all kinds of brochures about things that you can do to be a part of the ongoing ministry of Little White Chapel. And in your bulletin, there is a new piece called Be Reconciled. In two weeks, I invite you to bring an offering uh, so that we can continue our work for racial reconciliation. We have much work to do on many uh, fronts. There is a, another piece out on the table about stewardship with you. There is another piece out on the table about the Burbank Human Relations Council. If you want to know more about the Burbank Temporary Aid Center, there is another a brochure out there tomorrow for those of you who love to play golf. The Don Shelton Golf uh, 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 Classic is happening and there are wonderful prizes. And all of those things go to create a greater Christ-centered community that is different than the community that is out on the street where we learn to serve God rather than money. We won't always agree on the best way of serving God. But as a theologian, Cheryl Tack, once told me, when we come together as people of grace, we come together with the assumption already that we have each other's back. When we disagree, we do it lovingly, knowing that we seek the best for each other. Therefore, because we love and trust each other, there is nothing that we cannot work out because we've already gathered in love. We've already gathered with <coughs> love for each other. On the Little White Chapel Facebook page, there is a quote by theologian Soren Kierkegaard. He says the Bible is easy to understand, but we Christians are scheming swindlers. Scheming swindlers. He goes on to say, we pretend not to understand the Bible because the minute that we admit that we do, the minute that we admit that we do, we are obliged to follow its teachings and do what it says. Stop serving the God of money and use our vision and our imagination and our safe space and yes, our money to spread the grace of God. 